All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our event today to discuss the contested domain of space and the implications for defense and international security. I'm Carrie Bingen, the director of the Aerospace Security Project here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. It is a privilege to welcome Major General Sean Bratton, the first commander of the US Space Training and Readiness Command, STARCOM. So this is a multi-part event today. First, my chat with General Bratton to discuss how STARCOM is preparing guardians to operate in the contested domain of space. Then we'll take a short break and we will welcome a superb panel of my colleagues here at CSIS and from the Secure World Foundation to discuss why we're so focused on the topic of space and a, as a contested domain. They will each discuss recently released reports on trends in space threats and what they mean for policymakers. After General, General Bratton and I talk for a bit, I will turn to our audience for questions. Please submit your questions via the button on the website event page. And for some of the folks here in the audience, there's a QR code above me that you can, you can scan. So General Bratton has a very distinct background, different from other senior space leaders, that brings an important and valuable perspective to the development of Guardians. He spent much of his career, and still his career, in the Air National Guard, starting as an enlisted member, and then commissioned officer in the Air National Guard. His range of assignments include deployment to Iraq to coordinate air operations, commander of a cyberspace operations group within the Air National Guard, director of space forces at US Northern Command, and deputy director of operations at US Space Command. So General Bratton, with this very different background than most senior space leaders have today, the National Guard, you started enlisted, um, you were the first Air National Guardsman to attend the Space Weapons Instructor Course. Can you start with how that unique path has informed what you're doing now? And also just explain to us, what is STARCOM? What is Space Training and Readiness Command for, for folks that haven't gotten past the STARCOM part? <laughs> it's, um, well, it's definitely got the best name of anything in the Space Force, for sure. The uh, background-wise, just, uh, you know, it's a strange path. Everybody's career unfolds differently, for sure. Uh, you know, my plan was to be a high school teacher, and I had a degree in education, was headed that way, had enlisted in the Guard, and then um, ended up coming on active duty and, and through a, a strange series of events found myself here. It is, and I feel so fortunate um, to, to be, I, I don't know about the first commander, because it's really hard, but the, to be involved in the stand-up of the Space Force. Um, I had worked the stand-up of U.S. Space Command as well, so both those organizations, just instrumental in, in all the, the change within the DOD, it's just part of the change across the whole space ecosystem that's going on. But for Starcom specifically, um, pretty amazing time. We're, we're coming up on two years. In August, it'll be two years since the command stood up in a Space Force that's just three and a half years old. So, so everything's new, everything's for the first time. It, it gives you a lot of kind of freedom to think and do new things. Um, it's also difficult because there's no continuity from what has gone before in most cases. And so, it, it, you know, picking up the, opening the, the book to see how it was done previously is sometimes more difficult. We have, we have learned a lot from not just the Air Force, but the Army, Navy, Marines, and how they do training, education, and test. And that's what STARCOM does. The, the training and readiness command includes uh, writing the doctrine for the Space Force, all the training activities from the day someone enters the service to their most advanced training things that we do at places like uh, the test pilot school or the weapons school out at Nellis. Um, on the education side, you know, again, through the career of a guardian, all the education activities to include our, our new partnership with Johns Hopkins that, that maybe we'll talk about. And then, and perhaps uh, on the technical side, most challenging and interesting in some ways is all the operational test of new systems being fielded. And so, you know, bringing together the equipment and the personnel is really what we think about. How do we do that to prepare the force for competition and conflict? And, and that's what we're getting after every day across the enterprise. Well, so the theme of our event today is on this contested domain of space. Our second panel will talk about their reports on space threats that CSIS produced and then counter space weapons development that the Secure World Foundation produced. So can you describe a bit more of what that operating environment looks like that you're preparing guardians to, to operate within and what makes space a bit unique or different from some of those other domains? Yeah, it, it's, I mean, we see it across 
across the spectrum of events, in commercial space, in civil space, certainly in DOD and military space, both in the United States and around the world, just this sort of explosion of activity. More, more space, more activity happening, uh, more weapons development, more threats that we face. And so the, you know, the DOD specific aspect to that is how do we think about uh, our ability to operate in a contested domain, uh, maybe in ways that we hadn't had to think about before. Certainly when I was coming up as a space operator, it, it was very much the integration of space capabilities into a terrestrial fight. Um, and now should that fight extend into space, we gotta be ready for that. And so, you know, things like uh, rules of engagement and defensive space operations, offensive space operations are all these concepts that we, that we now have to prepare guardians to be able to do uh, within the domain as part of the Space Force you know, for whether it's U.S. Space Command or one of the other combatant commands. And so um, understanding of the threat and the new threats that are arising and then, you know, how do we, how do we specifically for STARCOM, how do I create an environment where we can practice and rehearse and do the activities that we need to do to really be ready for competition and conflict? Okay. So I want to dive into each of those because when I go to the STARCOM website, I see how you're organized and you have these yeah. five organizing units called deltas. Um, and I want to, to, to dive into each of those five areas. The first one is on doctrine and wargaming and you have the responsibility for developing space doctrine. One of the challenges, and we were just discussing this earlier, is you're preparing guardians for war fighting in space, yet we haven't fought in space, which is a very good thing. Yeah. So how do you develop doctrine when so much of military doctrine, the principles, the how, how we operate, it centers on learning from war fighting experience? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting and, and, and difficult challenge. We, um, you're exactly right. Normally, you, there, conflict occurs, you learn lessons from the conflict, and that, that goes into your doctrine. Certainly in air, land, and sea domains, we've been able to do that over the years. Uh, we've never fought in space, we don't want to, but we have to be ready. And, and when, if called upon, how would we operate um, in those circumstances? And so, uh, because there hasn't been a fight, we, you know, what we do today is we develop, we have ideas about how it might work. We think about things like how does key terrain apply to the space domain and how would we respond to a certain threat. So we have these ideas, we call them concepts. Um, and then we run our concepts through sort of a campaign of learning. And so we, we put ideas into wargaming, we um, sp sort of bring them to an intellectual body, a forum, and have them think about how we might, might do that. And, and w as we run a concept through the campaign of learning, if it, if it survives you know, all that contact along the way, um, and we think it's mature enough, we'll write it into a doctrine. We have not published our operational doctrine. What, what across the Joint Force you would call your 3.0 document, uh, space operations, um, it, it just, ha we haven't quite gotten it to, to a point where we're happy about it. I think um, right now we gave it to one of our advanced studies group, the sort of draft document, who's working with it through the summer. You know, I, I think it's feasible by the end of the year we'll actually have some operational doctrine that we feel is solid enough um, that we'll begin to, begin to publish to the force. But, but, the, uh, but the challenge is real on how do you do that when you've never done it. So perhaps a bit of a proxy could be wargaming. Yeah. Um, Starcom just concluded the Schriever War Game, which is the DoD's premier space war game. Can you share a little bit about Schriever and some of the insights that you gained, including you know, where where it surfaced potentially policy or operational issues? Yeah, it's um, Schriever War Game has been going on for a long time. That Delta Ten, who runs it, will will love that you called it the DoD's premier space war game. <laughs> I can see that on a banner <laughs> in their spaces right now. I'm trademarking um, that. It, it absolutely is. It's uh, you know the the capstone event is what we just held. Really, Schriever goes for about a year. It's a series of events, but the capstone we just had, I think it was uh, seven nations. Uh, total 14 commercial companies who come and participate in the war game, about 350 total players at the capstone. And we really worked through some interesting, there, there's always interesting policy discussions at Schriever when anytime you bring the nations together, you know, they each have a slightly different um, sense of, and thoughts about norms of behavior and things like counterproliferation and deterrence and how, we, how those apply in space. And we had a big discussion on, specifically on counterproliferation of of weapons versus um, 
sort of using strategic messaging as a deterrent effect and how do we weigh the value of that. And so that, that was a fascinating outcome. We're still writing the report. Um, we also did a lot of work uh, of the, what do we think about proliferated LEO? Um, there's certainly some, some recent lessons learned there out in the world on proliferated LEO and how, how much or little resiliency that provides. And so th I think that will come across in the final report, some of the, some of the thoughts on that. And then finally, the, just the absolute need for domain awareness and where maybe we fall short today. And, and I think that is an area where a lot of nations are very interested and willing to contribute um, and enhance capabilities to come together to, hey, let's make sure we understand what's going on in the domain. And, and that is the foundation of everything. Uh, wh whether you're focused on the threat or just the, you know, the safety aspect of space operations in the norms of behavior kind of sense that um, we have to have better domain awareness than we do today. And then perhaps another proxy is um, looking at how space has been used on the modern battlefield of Ukraine currently um, and in both the CSIS Space Threats Report as well as the Secure World Foundation uh, Counter Space Weapons Report, we talk about Russia's use of uh, cyber attacks and jamming against satellite communications, against GPS, particularly early in the conflict. Uh, are there lessons learned that you're deriving from what we're seeing play out in Ukraine that's informing what the Space Force is doing, informing your doctrine development, and then even perhaps, are we learning anything about Russia's doctrine? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we are absolutely absorbing that information like everyone is. Certainly the, the um, prevalence, willingness to use electromagnetic spectrum uh, weapons um, is clear. I mean, we, jamming has been around for a long time. It's just now, now that no one bats an eye at it, it's just an accepted part of warfare. Whether that's precision, you know, jamming a GPS for us, precision navigation and timing jamming, or communications, it, you know, that's just um, a reality of the modern battlefield, I would say, that, that we have to deal with. And we're developing specific training on how do we work through that, um, and we'll, t we'll, we'll maybe talk about the sky series and black skies and what we're doing. I, I think specific to Starcom, what we're learning, and, and this isn't um, unique to the space domain out of Ukraine, but the importance of the, the human element to the weapon system. And so that it, you can't just have exquisite technology or even good technology or great weapon systems if you don't have the trained force to operate those things. And, and that's really you know, why Starcom exists, to bring, bring the equipment, the capabilities together with the trained force and make sure that, that they can operate uh, together with coherent command and control, with leadership. So, so there's a leadership training aspect to this that we draw lessons from. All of that is within, within the team's responsibility at Starcom to deliver for the Space Force. And so that's certainly what I think about most you know, in this current position. Well, and that's on training and exercises. That's another delta um, within Starcom yeah. and focus. You just mentioned the Sky Series. Can you talk a little bit more about that? There's this running theme here of how do you do training and exercises in this domain where you can't really see it and touch it? So how are you building that, that combat readiness? Yeah, it, it's um, it maybe one of the areas we've made a lot of progress in a little time. We, you know, Space Flag has been around just like Shreve War Game for a long time. Um, Space Flag mainly an integration exercise sort of at the operational level. And so um, as the Space Force stood up and we moved to what's called the Space Force Generation Model, so this is how we present forces to combatant commands. Um, and Space Operations Command, General Whiting's team, you know, is working through that every day. How do they present a crew force to fly GPS um, to operate the, the various space systems that we present to the command commands? You know, we have the, the readiness word in our name. We, we need to make those forces ready before they go. And we knew we needed a more tactical level experience um, to work through their, the specific readiness issues of each of the units, each, the crew force within, the, um, within Spock. And so the, so the Sky Series was the solution um, that we're working right now. And so Black Skies, we've executed two of those. The first one was just last year. We just did another one um, that is electromagnetic warfare. Black Skies focused on the EW units. How do we think about command and control? How do we have an understanding of the threat? Um, it brings the intelligence, cyber, and the EW communities together against a complex problem set.
and, and as much as possible, we do live activities, and so live fire electromagnetic warfare. Um, we'll go to Red Skies this summer. We'll have the first iteration of Red Skies. So Red Skies is orbital warfare. How do we deal with an orbital warfare problem set? What are the challenges that faces in intelligence and command and control and operations? And um, that'll be Red Skies for the first time. And then next year, we'll do Blue Skies, which is a cyber warfare event uh, focused on, on Delta VI within Spock, but really our defensive cyber forces and how do they respond. Um, and again, working command and control and intel the t intelligence aspects of that. So the Sky Series is really enhancing readiness for Space Operations Command. Um, and we're learning a ton. And it, and it really, one, we are, we are building and working on a test and training infrastructure that enables us to do these exercises. And so there's a lot of work uh, going on there and certainly more to do. Um, we're also learning to how to communicate. You know, we talked to the Space Operations Command folks who really, they levy requirements on us. We need to train against, you know, uh, this threat or we need to train these specific objectives for the crew force. Um, and just the processes of how that happens. Um, we spend a lot of time with the Air Force Warfare Center understanding how they do that interaction with the operational units. And we, and we in some cases, uh, took what they, they did and in some cases we went a different way. But um, so that's the delivery of the, or the delivery mechanism is the Skies series. And then, um, and then we pr we'll, we'll modify that. We meet regularly with Spock to kind of modify objectives. How many of any, any particular Skies exercise do they need in a given year to, to meet the needs of the crew force? But yeah, it's pretty, pretty exciting, a lot going on. I'm, I'm excited for Red Skies uh, coming up this summer. And so then how does that Sky Series relate to the Space Force's National Space Test and Training Complex? And how do you yeah. strike that balance between simulations and you mentioned live fire. How do you do live fire exercises? Because yeah. you can't really blow stuff up. No, we, and, we, and, we, and we don't want to, and we, we won't do that. The, um, so there is, there, uh, the, so the uh, General Saltzman usually talks about Operational Test and Training Infrastructure, OTTI. In Starcom, we talk a lot about the National Space Test and Training Complex, and we, we, we do what the DOD always does. We took a bunch of words and made an acronym, so National Space Test and Training Complex becomes NSTTC, and then we make a word out of the acronym, so NSTTC, we call it the NISTIC. And so in the, the NISTIC is the place we go to train, sort of like the gym that you go to work out in to get stronger. Um, that is a big piece of operational test and training infrastructure, but it's, it's different. You know, when I grew, I grew up in, in the Air Force, I would go to Nellis Air Force Base and the Nevada Test and Training Range in Southern Nevada. You know, the Air Force kind of carved out some real estate there that they, they do test and training in. The Army did the same thing in the National Training Center in California. We, we, we obviously can't do that in low Earth orbit or in geo. There's no sovereignty there. So, um, so how do we do that within, within lines of kind of norms of behavior and safe and responsible space operations? How do we communicate we're doing a test or training activity? Um, how do we think about um, being professional in the domain, you know, in line with what we would expect from other people? And so all those things still come into play um, as, we, as we move to conducting sort of live training on orbit. And then you mentioned last month at the National Space Symposium, uh, plans for an industry day related to the NSTIC. The NSTIC, NSTIC, yeah. oh, shoot. Um, what role do you envision industry playing, and, and where do you see that going? Yeah, we have, it's, it's um, there is an industry day, I think 20, 22, 23 June in Colorado Springs, um, and, and we can get more information out there. I think it's, it's um, out there on one of the government websites, but the, the key, there's some key capabilities we need. One, for test activities on orbit, um, we need, we need the infrastructure that allows us to gather the test data. And so that's everything from, you know, uh, telemetry tracking and control of the spacecraft to, in some cases, constant observation of the activity. So there's lots of sensors out there that we task to observe what's going on in space. But when you're running a test or training activity, you really want sort of constant observation. So whether that means a, a sort of a witness satellite that is off to the side observing the activity for safety and for, um, for range safety and responsible behavior, or it's a sensor on the ground, a radar, or a telescope, or something. So there are some dedicated space sensors we think we need so we don't impact the operational sensors, um, the TTNC, and then really this the architecture that supports it all. So 
you know, at industry day, we'll get into the details of the NISTIC, but there's really pieces of it for electromagnetic, for orbital warfare, for cyber. But the, the architecture that brings it all together is the, the NISTIC-D, the digital aspect. And so that's where we talk about data storage and communications and dissemination of information, the use of digital twins. I, I mean, all that comes together. We, we absolutely are relying on industry, uh, you know, across the board on, on not just the NISTIC, but OTTI writ large uh, to help us both solve problems and provide capabilities that we don't have today. Yeah. You know, the other thing that I'm just struck by, too, is just t space is a very technical domain. Um, when we think about cyber penetrations or attacks, we think about jamming or uh, I, I had good fortune to go to Peterson and, and to Schriever and to see some of the, the operation centers is you don't necessarily see threats coming at you. You see it through a spectrograph or a powered uh, spectral density plot yeah. or um, other, other very t lines of code, other very technical means. So, so how do you build that, that, I'll say, technical proficiency? How do you distinguish between anomalies and, and threats without everyone having to be a, a, a graduate aerospace engineer or computer scientist? Yeah, it's, um that inability to experience domain, it's really interesting. You're, we're trying to build a service of guardians and all the kind of the things that go into that, but unlike air, land, and sea, you can't, you can't reach out and touch it unless, you're, you, know, unless you become an astronaut. Um, so the, it's a challenge there. Certainly we rely on modeling and simulation to do that, um, and I think that's key. I think this idea of you know, operations and engineering come together, we're really, we're, we're really delving deeply into that. We used to think, and a lot of people talk about sort of eras of space. So the early era of where all the engineers were solving tough problems, you know, the Apollo 13, hey, we, we got to figure out how to save the astronauts kind of thing. Um, and we absolutely, that, that was absolutely true at the beginning of space. And then we sort of normalized it into operations, and you saw the emergence of civil and commercial space, and non-engineers could, could contribute and operate spacecraft without having to solve all those tough problems because they'd been solved. Um, they, and then the era I grew up in was integration. It was about bringing space into air, land, and sea, into the joint fight, you know, Desert Storm, um, operations in the Middle East. And so, and, the, and then now today we talk about, you know, war fighting within a domain. And we, sometimes we talk about those as if they're four distinct eras. And that's not untrue, but from the training aspect, we still need all four of those things. We still need engineers and rigorous operators. We still need integration, and we and we need space war fighters. And so, it's how do I how do I train across the guardians, all of these things because we can't do without either either one. And so, um, you know, we have the discrete career fields, but I think we'll start to see a lot more blending within the training pipeline. One, making them work together instead of instead of different tribes. I think that integration of space cyber intelligence is really powerful, and that's how they operate in the crew force. But then the inclusion of acquisitions and engineering within the training pipeline. Um, General Gutline out at SSC is really pushing us on, hey, I need more operational experience within my acquisition community. At the same time, General Saltzman's saying, hey, the operators need to know more about acquisitions. And so I think we'll see um, within the training pipelines a lot more kind of mixing of the tribes, a lot more integration that happens, and, and we're working on some ways to do that. I think that that blending is really interesting, and I've, if I look to the commercial sector uh, for an example, uh, we've, we've seen reports that Starlink has continued to, uh, uh, the Russians have, have attempted yeah. to jam Starlink. I, I almost envision that there are people writing lines of code sitting next to the operators, and that's all happening very dynamically in real time. I think, how do we get to a model with Space Force, with the operators, the engineers, uh, the acquirers together that are doing that kind of dynamic work? No, I th I'm, that's, a, that's a great analogy. I hadn't thought about that. But the, I mean, if you imagine that, first you have to understand the threat, so you have the intelligence community there. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if there's a, any cyber coding e, EW aspect, you've got the, the cyber teammates there and then the operators, the engineers. Um, I mean, that is sort of the perfect crew force that, that we want to deliver to Spock, the, the understanding. I, you know, it's maybe too much to think that we would put that all in one person, but we don't, we don't operate as single individuals. We operate as crews. And so as long as we can build a crew force that has all that capability in it and deliver it. But I, I think our, our awareness of, um, and maybe because I'm close to the test 
aspect of it, but the value of engineering in operations. You know, what, when I go to Edwards and I see the test pilot school out there, and we're putting guardians through the test pilot school, one of our highest in engineering schools, you know, I think that's equally valuable to what comes out of Nellis and the weapons school. But, and when you put them together, it's just a, a super powerful team to solve, you know, the exact problems that you're pointing out. Yeah. Well, and then, so let me talk, go back to commercial as well. The National Defense Strategy describes Department of Defense as a fast follower uh, in yeah. commercial space. Uh, there's a, a lot of um, really innovative and, and, and interesting things ha happening in the commercial space sector, areas being commercialized that were long just within the re realm of governments. So how are you incorporating commercial space into guardian training and exercises? Yeah, it, it's that's a great question. Certainly, we you know we we always point to Shriver War Game and fourteen companies came and that's fantastic. It, I I don't know that that's enough anymore. Um, I mean, commercial can really provide some solutions and capabilities, and and I don't mean provide them to the DoD to then operate, but just provide the solution as an end state. And so I you know I think. Um, both SSC and Spock are working hard on that. From the training aspect, you know, we, we rely like everybody does on commercial to provide, but we're having interesting discussions on do I, well, what if guardians, you know, we've always had education with industry, but what if it's training with industry? Now, th there's some risk there because you give up the, the ability to kind of control culture and develop identity as a guardian if, if a new guardian is out with the industry learning how to fly a spacecraft. But, but there's absolutely lessons to come across. So I, I don't know that I've found kind of where that sweet spot is, but, but there's something there that w we need to get to on how could we benefit from industry. And, and by the way, you know, ho hopefully the reverse would be true as well. And then a similar question for our allies and partners, how do you start bringing that capability and you know, their different policy constructs or, 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 what, or potential limitations, how do you bring them into your training and exercise environment? Yeah, they, um, they, are, they are demanding customers already, for, for sure. There's, there is an appetite for training and education uh, more so that, than we can meet, and we're, and we're working hard. We do a lot of delivery of curriculum to the allies now, and I think working with the team at the Pentagon in international affairs that we will, we will continue to do and, and even raise the bar and do more than we, we're doing now. So we bring a lot of allies through the schoolhouses, uh, mostly on the education side, but I think, I think there'll be more and more on the training side. And then, of course, you know, continuous involvement with the uh, with Shreve War Game, I, th I think the driver for us, and we're starting to have the conversation with the, the new component field commands that are out there in the combat command. So in Indo-Pacific, for example, General Mastelier, he, you know, he's looking back at Starcom saying, hey, I, I need, you know, things from you, one of which is integration with allies for command and control, for example, to figure that out. And so, you know, we deliver a war game to him called Polaris Hammer um, to, to try and help him out. But that, the tempo of that will increase, the, th the throughput or the capacity needs to increase for sure. Okay. And then one of the, the opportunities I had last year was to participate in, in an early planning workshop for Schriever uh, with commercial yeah. uh, and, and allied uh, operators. And there was this great discussion on, hey, if you want these commercial partners there in times of conflict, We've got to back that up and work more on the integration front and work through some of those rules of engagement kind of now in peacetime so that, that, that it's ready and working functionally in conflict. So how is that dynamic unfolding? Well, I mean, we played a lot of that uh, um, at Shriver for sure. There's really interesting discussions and, and, and working towards solutions. I wouldn't say we haven't figured out yet, but on... Um, defense of commercial assets, for example. When, when, if ever, would we do that? What, when would commercial ask for that? Um, and are we prepared? And, and like I said, then we have to kind of train and rehearse those things. And so um, we, we, we certainly m move the ball a little bit downfield at Shriva War Game in thinking about how to do that. When would we do that? There's a lot of policy um, that comes into play for, uh, there for sure. But there's also examples in other domains. And so, it, you know, as much as we think we're breaking new ground, may, maybe there's good examples out there that we can follow. And then it, certainly in the, in the pr preparation of guardians for conflict, you know, I have to stick that into the, tr into the training program when the time's right. So first, the policy piece, and we'll continue to, to tease that out of Wargaming's, you know, 
at the same time as saying that, we, we have the commercial integration cell. We point to it a lot out of Vandenberg, where we are day-to-day -day operating with commercial. So, um, so there, there's more to do there. There's certainly more to learn and think about, um, and we're learning and thinking about all of it. And then that, that segues me into the next topic of tactics, techniques, procedures, so yeah. TTPs. And I'm, I'm struck by the challenge that you have in developing TTPs and then some of those hard policy and operational questions that are emerging with the threats that we're seeing. Uh, the expanded commercial capabilities we just talked about and some of the questions raised on the role of government there. And just the greater number of actors, both domestically and internationally in space. Uh, we talk about in both of our CSIS and Secure World reports things like the Russian Cosmos satellite trailing a U.S. government satellite in LEO, a Russian Luch satellite out at GEO stalking commercial satellites, yeah. this cat and mouse uh, activity in GEO between a U.S. Department of Defense satellites and uh, Chinese satellites. It raises a lot of these questions, like how close is too close? How do you assess intent? Um, who has the authority to take action? So how is Starcom thinking about these issues and, and how are you going down that path of developing TTPs for many of these questions are kind of being raised really yeah. for the first time for the force? The, it, it was interesting. I was at US Space Command as the deputy J3. Um, General Raymond was in command at the time when the Russian inspector satellite in low Earth orbit, we worked through that problem set. And it, at one point, I picked up the phone and called my counterpart over at NORAD, and we had a great discussion about what do you do when a bomber flies down the coast of the United States? Like, I, and I see, you know, they're tweeting about it and they're talking about it. I'm like, why do you do these things? And wh wh what's the thinking? Like, what do you expect to get out of sort of that public messaging campaign where you're pointing out bad behavior? And and we we learned a lot from those guys and uh, on how they think about it. You know, it's is there is it is there a, realistic expectation that someone's going to change behavior because you call it out every time. Maybe, maybe not, but you build a sort of body of uh, discussion and evidence that comes into play that then leads to things like norms of behavior. And so the, the, the open discussion of activity is, is really good. The open discussion of, hey, we think this is bad behavior. What do our allies think about that? Um, what are, what are other countries who aren't our allies think about that behavior? Do we, you know, do we all see it the same? That really leads to the, the, the much needed sort of policy, um, not just within the United States, but you know, internationally, the policy implications. And so that, those early discussions we had where we learned from the other domains that ultimately led, you know, arguably for the first time ever, open discussion about what was going on in LEO in low Earth orbit um, was really good. So, you know, that was that I, bringing that thinking into Starcom on um, there's a lot of problems to solve. There's also a lot of people who have faced similar problems, e even if it's in another domain. What can we learn from maritime operations, for example, and how they do test and training in international waters? Um, and bringing those things in. The, the, when you get down to the tactics, techniques, procedures level with specific weapon systems, I mean, that is, you know, part of the desire for the Sky series is to give a venue for the operational community to come try out new things, you know, in the safety of, a, of an observed range environment so we can, you know, we can make sure that things go exactly as they're supposed to be or call knock it off if we need to. Um, I think we're, we're building the place to, to learn and do these things. It's really, it's really good. There's a, there's, a long, there's a lot to do, but it's really good. Well, you're, you're, it's interesting, your comment on the what, what do we do if we see a, a Chinese or Russian bomber flying near the coastline and the public messaging that, that the, 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 the direct and maybe perhaps indirect messaging that we do? Space has long been a domain where everything is just so highly classified yeah. and compartmentalized. So is, is, do you think that uh, some of the activity we're seeing now that there is a, uh, a more deliberate push to whether it's declassify, leverage commercial data, you know, how are we rethinking that kind of messaging? Yeah, it's, I, you know, we talk about declassification all the time. General Saltzman really challenged us um, recently to, hey, it's, you have to stop just talking about it. You have to really dig into the problem. You know, what does the security classification guide say? Who is the declassification authority? You know, we have to pull the threads on each of these individual things rather than just, you know, we say classification is a problem, 
and the, you know, and then we go back to our desk and work on something else. And so, th not that there's not a lot of people working on it. There absolutely is. But he sort of challenged each of us to, hey, y y you own part of this. Some of you are classification authorities. We write and and um, coordinate on classification guides. And so, a little bit, it was, you know, we each have to do our part in that discussion. Um, I think, you know, I think we we've, we've made as much as. It feels like sometimes there's no progress. We've made tremendous progress in the past five years of things that we're talking, we're talking about now that maybe we wouldn't have just a few years ago. And so uh, I think we'll keep moving forward. We'll keep working on the problem set for sure. If I can shift here a bit to education and culture, um, Space Force is trying some different constructs for its workforce education yeah. and for its pro yeah. professional development. Can you talk to some of these different approaches and, and how they're going. It's, um, the, you know, the big headline for us uh, last fall was the partnership with Johns Hopkins. And it was interesting, when, when I stepped into the Starcom job, um, there wasn't a lot of written guidance on what to go do. And there, there was actually just two things that were very specified tasks that were written in the Capstone publication. And one was establish independent professional military education for the Space Force by 2023. Um, and so, you know, that went to the top of the list because it was, it was clearly articulated. Um, but we had to figure out what to do. And the Space Force is so small, it didn't, after some, pretty, you know, some analysis, it was clear that hey, it didn't make sense to build like Space University, to build our own schoolhouse. It, it, the, as a service, we were just too small to warrant that, the amount of resources that would take given the throughput of students uh, that we have for very specifically for officer education programs at, in the intermediate and senior level. And so, but we did have, um, we do have guidance from the joint staff that all the services have to abide, sort of abide by um, to meet certain thresholds for education. So, uh, so in the end, we went with the partnership approach and uh, we, you know, we went across country, but ultimately there was a, a request for a proposal that went out and Johns Hopkins was selected. Uh, for this for this new program that and we're really excited students show up for the first time in July just right down the street here mm -hmm. at the School of Advanced International Studies Johns Hopkins SICE and so uh, we'll have guardians there but we'll also have airmen and soldiers and sailors uh, with us to meet that joint accreditation requirement as well as civilian students um, They'll, they'll get a space curriculum that meets the joint standards, so they'll get the, the, both the joint curriculum that's prescribed by the joint staff, the Space Forces curriculum, as, and then have access to the Johns Hopkins curriculum as well. And so that, you know, that combination of things, we're, we're really excited about the program and, and what it'll provide. Um, now, we're, now we're working on the enlisted uh, education piece, and so you know, we did have the, the NCO Academy at Peterson came over as part of Starcom. We're working hard on the curriculum for the enlisted force. And then for both officer enlisted, that entry level, we call it primary level education. Um, there's a lot of work to do there. We haven't tackled that yet. It's just capacity of the staff to get work done. And so, so we intentionally focus on kind of our specified tasks, but um, with the Johns Hopkins program, but there's more to do in that space and we're getting after it. But uh, but really excited for the summer and the new program. It's going to be great. Well, and what, what's, I want to talk about culture. What's the adage? You know, culture eats strategy for yeah. breakfast. Yeah. But y y you have a bit of a clean sheet here. How is the Space Force culture development going? Um, I've noticed you've got a lot of really <laughs> young, bright guardians, and I it's, know that the Chief of Space Operations has really challenged them to bring their ideas forward. You're bringing uh, together other service service transfers into the Space Force. So, so how are you building that very unique culture distinct from the Air Force? Yeah, we, um, we talked almost obsessively about this in the first year. I mean, we, we really wanted a distinct culture for the Space Force. And then I think uh, we, we realized that, you know, you can't prescribe it. You create the environment for it and, and you, um, you bring, you know, you try and establish the culture you want by creating the environment. And so, so we did some early looks at, at folks that maybe are, maybe are good at this, both in industry and academia. Um, I, I talk a lot about what, um, Texas A&M. And so I got you know, friends that went there. If you know anyone from Texas A&M, you know, because they tell you right away they went there and how great it was. <laughs> the, um, and so I, you know, we, we talked to them about, hey, what happens? Someone goes to that institution for four years and then they are, you know, 
committed and connected to that institution for the rest of their lives. And there's lots of places that do this really well, but what happens in the four years that you're at a university that connect you to that university for the rest of your life? Uh, the, the Marine Corps is fantastic at this. Some, you know, Harley Davidson, there's a lot of examples out there, but, um, and, we, and we discovered some things. One, uh, you know, the, the, the appropriate use of kind of ceremony and ritual is important. It makes people feel connected to an organization. The sense of joining something that's greater than yourself. Um, and also the, uh, the level of difficulty. So accomplishing a very difficult thing that maybe at least you feel other people might not be able to do. Um, and there's some communities that, you know, special operations community, weapons school, there's places that have that. And they, the, all of those create a sense of identity. Um, and and you got, it, there's some fine lines to walk there because it can go bad if you do it wrong. And so we have introduced some of those things and we, and we continue to think through the appropriate one. So, for example, we do a, a patching ceremony. When you come in the Space Force, at the end of your initial training, um, you get a Space Force patch. And so, in the Space Force now, you, the patch you get is always worn by somebody else. So, you get someone else's patch and they write you a note, like, this is my patch and here's some advice and, you know, good luck on your career. And by the way, someday you will give this patch, you know, to someone else. And so, that just that sense of connection from the little ceremony. So, when you watch people get them, I mean, they're they're reading this and digesting it. Um, I was at the space symposium, just walking the floor there between events, and a, a young guardian came up to me, and Specialist Andrews, and I had, I had put the patch on his shoulder at basic training eight months before, and you know, I, I have trouble remembering anybody, even, even myself, my, much less a, a specialist that I met, but he came right up to me, hey sir, I just want you to know, you know, eight months ago you put the patch on, really appreciate that. It was a really, you know, almost emotional moment for me on here's this young guardian who doesn't hesitate at all, by the way, to walk up to a two-star general and, and say, you know, I have a connection with you because of this probably 60-second interaction where I put a patch on his shoulder and shook his hand and welcomed him to the Space Force. Um, those things create connection, create commitment to the organization. You know, we'll see in, over time what that looks like in retention. Well, and I, I want to stick on stick on this topic of young guardians and, and this next generation talent. This will be my last question before I shift to uh, audience questions here. Um, but we've talked about a lot of meaty issues, policy, operational, technical issues that the Space Force has ahead of it. Um, we have these these bright young guardians coming up uh, up through the Space Force. We're fortunate today to have some young undergraduate students from George Washington University, the Delta Phi Epsilon uh, co-ed International Foreign Service Fraternity. Uh, Yash Bajaj, one of our aerospace interns here, is the, the president of that organization. Um, so a lot of young talent out there. How are we doing on advancing the intellectual work? What do you really need out of these next generation guardians, uh, students that are graduating and entering the workforce here to help the Space Force and where you're headed? Yeah, um, that's a great question. The one, you know, you guys should all join the Space Force, so the door is open. Um, you'll have many, many of the opportunities ahead of you. I, I'd say there, there's some, some things that we are really trying to tackle. One is the, the war fighting doctrine for space. Um, what does that contest look like? How will we operate? And that's probably the greatest intellectual challenge that STARCOM itself faces uh, on, on what will we do if, if, that, if called upon uh, to have that fight. I think the, the work that's already going on and that needs contribution is norms of behavior. You know, what, is, what are the international agreements that need to be put in place for norms of behavior? How do we th contribute to that intellectually to that discussion, how do we work with our partners to establish those things? There's a lot of great work going on um, in that area, but more, more is definitely needed because we have we haven't uh, achieved it yet. The, the norms of behavior, you know, on the big heavy lifting intellectual piece. I think um, I think you know may, maybe down at a more simple level and, and things that I when I think about what do I need help with other than the warfighting doctrine is you know how, what. Um, and we'll learn this over time, is really, we don't have a recruiting problem. There's lots of people that want to come in the Space Force, and we're so small that, you know, it, it, we don't face the same challenges that the other services do. I think what remains to be seen is the retention piece, and what 
and part of this goes back to the culture, what contributes to someone's commitment to an organization and willingness to say, and then what can we as an organization do to be flexible and allow people you know, to follow a career path that's interesting to them, that maybe takes them out of the Space Force but brings them back at a later date. I think those sort of new, innovative, wh whether you put that under the banner of human resources or force development, I think we have to really think through and do some smart things to retain the talent that we're building. And this ties in well to a question from the audience here. This is David Burbage from the Naval War College. So for students at the non-Space Force staff in war colleges, what is most important for them to learn about space, especially given the limited curriculum time that they have? So it is a really interesting question is how do you ensure that you're not just training space people, but you're yeah. bringing space to the other services? No, it's, um, we are part of the joint force. And, and so, hey, David, I'm a Naval War College graduate, so good on you. Um, I, I think the, joint, the uh, true for any domain, just like the Navy has to understand what air and land bring, they nap, you know, we have to add on to that. You, the, the, in, the naval, in the maritime domain, you have to understand this, your dependencies on space and, and how you can leverage that to advantage um, as well. And we've done this, you know, we've done this over the years, um, in, especially in our kind of integration phase in Desert Storm, how do we bring space in? But it was usually like this, you know, I would go out as a space officer and teach that. Um, I think the responsibility now it, it, to some degree is each service needs to understand their interaction with space and their dependencies just like they do with the other domains. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is a space force and it is, it is our responsibility to be experts in our domain and operations and, could, and then deliver that to the joint force. And so um, should they be teaching space at Naval War College? Absolutely. Uh, should we be teaching Navy at, at space school? Absolutely. You know, it goes both ways. And so, but I think it all comes together in the combat commands as part of the joint force. I want to go back to an earlier part of our conversation on exercises. There are several questions here, including from Aperva Minchikar uh, at Inside Defense that wants to know more about the Sky Series. Yeah. So can you give a little bit more information on the upcoming Red Skies and Blue Skies Series? And what, what does that live simulation look like, particularly for Red Skies? Yeah, we just did, we just did a sort of an experiment um, in February, I think it was, uh, leading up to Red Skies, um, that we had the, the Orbital Warfare Range and Aggressor Units fly in a spacecraft called Tetra-1, the Space Systems Command and AFRL have come together on. And so, and how do we think about, for like, rendezvous and proximity operations? So someone is approaching you with a spacecraft, what do you do about it? From the exercise owner point of view, it's how do you conduct these activities safely? How do you observe to make sure everyone is following the rules? And so we're working through that campaign now to make sure that we can present on a range, you know, a, a, a closed environment that's safe and professional. And so, um, so we flew Tetra One. We did just some, you know, distant RPO activities. Um, out at GEO to thinking through the sort of range procedures. That will all feed, you know, what we're learning with the range and aggressor units now will feed into Red Skies. Um, there are some capability gaps, and so, you know, part of the industry day is, hey, what, you know, what do I need to present as threat surrogates um, in an event like Red Skies or Blue Skies or, or even Black Skies? And so, we're working closely with the intel community to make sure that we're accurately representing the threats that we'll face. Um, Blue Skies is still far out. We haven't done a ton of work. We're working hard on the range environment that I can have sort of uh, representative terrain of, let's say, the ground architecture for, for infrared satellites for SIBRs. And then I can, I can replicate that in a range environment so we can go red versus blue in a closed environment. Um, the, the, you know, Cyber Command and the Cyber Units, and in my background, I have that. We, 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 we know how to do that. I just have to create the, the hardware that lets us then create the environment um, to do that. So that's a little bit of what's going on with Skies. Uh, we'll keep doing Black Skies as well next year, um, it, all, all to increase readiness for Spock, really. It's great to see that tight coupling between Space Command and Cyber Command as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to also shift here to space threats, and this is a question from Shreya Ladd from George Washington University. So if non-escalatory, non-kinetic counter space threats are the most common, so jamming, cyber, et cetera, is deterrence an effective strategy against this type of threat? 
Should the focus be on deterring kinetic attacks and then achieving resilience against these non-kinetic cyber jamming type attacks? Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if I, I think that there's an interesting question there on escalatory or non-escalatory, e even though it's non-kinetic and, um, you know, it doesn't cause debris and anything. But um, I, think, I think that's a great question there. We, we've picked at that a little bit. It came up in Shriver Wargame on, do you try and control proliferation of jammers, for example? Um, is that a viable strategy versus just um, sort of strategic communications and calling out bad behavior? Hey, you're interfering with my signal. This is not, a, not okay. Um, I, I don't know. We're still writing the report on that, so it's, you know, I, wouldn't, I won't draw conclusions um, until I kind of read the data on it. But um, it, it, it is something that we're thinking about. I think the, what we learned from the other domains is there's always value added in calling out bad behavior, only if it's to reinforce what we think good behavior is that hopefully becomes a norm of behavior. And so I, I think, you know, I, I'm certainly, I'm not at U.S. Space Command anymore, but I, I think that that is an approach that's viable and that they continue to, to embrace. Okay. No, super. As we're winding down here, I wanted to just uh, ask you, uh, maybe to reflect upon the last two years, you were you stood up Star yeah. Starcom. You were its first leader. Uh, you mentioned you're coming up on your two-year birthday at Starcom. Um, re reflect on that and and where you're where it's headed from here. It, um, yeah, it feels like a hundred years ago. It's and and any time if you get an opportunity to, to start up a new organization, it, it is super rewarding. The um, I think that you know the workload is high, and the, and there, you got to figure out how to do everything for the first time. But the the ability to influence the direction of the organization is is also high. I mean, you're you, all the whole team, not not me, the whole team. You know, fingerprints are on every aspect, from from logos and patches and and um, visions to the very practical. Hey, we're going to have a new exercise series. We need to do more for the operators in this area, and that results in black skies, red skies, blue skies. I mean, it, it's amazing across the Space Force how much influence just individual guardians have on, on shaping the, this new service. Um, certainly, certainly as much as I have uh, as the leader of the organization, everyone in the organization has. So it, it's a pretty great time. We have done a ton. I'm super proud of, of the team. You know, everything from the Johns Hopkins programs, you know, new guardian, first guardian graduation and basic training, um, Officer Training School, a new curriculum for ROTC, a close, close partnership with the Air Force Academy to, to these most advanced things. You know, the, we're building out the Space Test Pilot School, Space Test Course out at Edwards, um, with, which is high-end engineering work. Um, you know, the work we've done at the Weapons School. So across the sort of the spectrum of need, I think we're delivering. Now there's absolutely more to do, just like there is in, in every one of our jobs. But, uh, but it's a great time. It's exciting to be part of DOD space and then just, you know, as a fan and enthusiast, just watching, you know, civil space, commercial space, all the things that are going on is pretty, pretty exciting times for all of us. Well, General Bratton, thank you very much for your time today, your leadership overall. You have an excellent team that we've enjoyed working with. Um, you've given us a glimpse into so many areas and issues that you're wrestling with, so we very much appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank McKenna Young, Caitlin Johnson, our production team here at CSIS, our interns Yash Bajaj and Patrick Fish. We're going to take a short break here. We'll be back at 3 p.m. to start our next discussion with uh, a superb group of people, uh, my colleagues at CSIS's Aerospace Security Project and the Secure World Foundation. They're going to talk about the, our respective space threat reports and what they mean for national security going forward. So thank you.
Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the second part of today's event, discussing the contested domain of space and the implications for defense and international security. I am McKenna Young, Associate Fellow with the Aerospace Security Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, to follow on to today's earlier discussion with Major General Bratton, the commander of STARCOM, uh, the second panel will discuss counterspace capability development over the past year uh, and why we're so focused on the topic of space as a contested domain. I'd like to introduce my colleagues here today. Uh, we have Brian Whedon, the Director of Program Planning from the Secure World Foundation, Caitlin Johnson, the Deputy Director of the Aerospace Security Project here at CSIS, uh, and Victoria Sampson, the Washington Office Director from the Secure World Foundation. Uh, each of our organizations has just released a new report. Uh, we've got props today. We have CSIS's 2023 Space Threat Assessment uh, and the Global <laughs> Counterspace Capabilities <laughs> Report from the Secure World Foundation. Uh, this is the sixth iteration of both of these reports, which are unclassified and based on open source information and reporting about counterspace developments, uh, both over time and specifically over the last year. We'll discuss these reports and trends in space threats and what they mean for policymakers. We are also taking questions from the audience, so please feel free to ask questions using the Ask Live Questions button on the event page. Uh, so I'd like to start by bringing us back to April of 2022, uh, where at a joint event, we had State Department officials discussing a new US lead led uh, anti-satellite test ban. Uh, Victoria and Brian, I know this is something that the Secure World Foundation spends a lot of time working on. Uh, Victoria, I'd like to start with you and ask what momentum you've seen in the last year uh, on the discussion of banning debris creating ASAT tests and what has the international feedback been? Sure, thank you, McKenna, and thank you to CSIS for hosting us. We're really excited to be here with our good friends and colleagues talking about an issue that we think is incredibly important for international security and stability. So the U.S. announcement in April of 2022 to do a commitment not to conduct destructive anti-satellite missile tests, and it was worded very carefully, um, was done largely because of the, the negative consequences in terms of the debris that's created. Um, the debris that comes in the test is around for a while. It's hard to come back. It takes a while to come back down. It endangers everyone. Um, it's agnostic in terms of who it approaches. So it's really something that's destabilizing for the space regime. So the U.S. was the first to announce it. Um, and then in the past year, it has been joined by 12 other countries. So 13 countries total have made this commitment not to conduct destructive anti-satellite missile test, which is great. Um, we would encourage other countries to show leadership and do this as well. But in addition, it's shown up in a couple other places. Uh, there's been an international discussion of uh, norms behavior at the UN called an open-ended working group on space threats, where the idea is the international community is intending to try and identify what is considered responsible behavior, what is considered irresponsible behavior, and how do you move forward in terms of uh, what are you trying to promote in terms of best practices. And so the idea of not deliberately creating debris on orbit through anti-satellite tests, that's one of the, the topics brought up there. And it seems to be increasingly um, accepted by a lot of countries that this is a bad idea just because of the debris that's created. Um, but also, um, the United Nations General Assembly had a resolution in December of last year where 155 countries voted in support of a, a resolution that says basically to, we support not having a direct descent anti-satellite test to create debris. And we encourage more countries to sign on to this um, moratorium as well. Um, so that's a big deal. Uh, that's a lot of countries, 155 voted in support, nine were against, nine abstentions. Um, so you could say that there's kind of a norm coalescing that this is considered bad form and that hopefully we'll see this continue to grow in terms of it becomes like maybe even customary international law, who knows. It could be crazy, in a couple of years we could even see a treaty on this issue, which if you know me, I would never would have said treaties were even an option a couple of years ago, but I am cautiously optimistic that this could actually happen. So very excited about this, and it's, it's important because it's not going to save space security, but it's a really good first step in terms of identifying that there are um, benefits for limiting freedom of action. There's a cost-benefit analysis that's really helpful, and I could probably spend the whole hour talking about it, but I won't. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so kind of still on that ASAT trend, uh, you know, we've seen ASATs from four countries, the U.S., Russia, China, and India in 2019. Uh, Brian, I was hoping you could speak to the usability or maybe lack thereof of ASATs. Yeah. No, uh, it's a great question. Um, I think there is a, a sense just, you know, looking at these on paper that, of course, the ability to launch a missile from the ground or a ship or an aircraft and destroy a satellite um, is a useful military capability that we need to have in our toolbox. And I think that is something that 
I think several countries obviously may have come across and said, yes, we would think so. Um, I wonder if that might be changing. And, and I think there's a hypothesis that the actual military utility of those kinds of one-shot destructive capabilities may be diminishing over time. Um, and I think that is connected to what was mentioned in the previous panel, which was the emergence of proliferated LEO, large constellations, ways to build architect space capabilities that are resilient to those kinds of single point failures where you take out one satellite and you've either taken out you know, all the capability or a significant portion of the capability and it's hard to replace. Um, and I put out this as a hypothesis, right? I can't prove it. Um, it'll be interesting to see how things evolve over time. But you know, we were talking about uh, sort of what we're seeing happening in the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, you know, Russia did their anti satellite test, uh, uh, you know, a few months before the invasion, and there certainly were uh, those people speculating that Russia may have done that to send a warning, to you know, deter the U.S. or NATO from getting involved in Ukraine, lest that they lose their satellites. If that was the message, it didn't work. The U.S. and many European countries are heavily involved in supporting Ukraine. And moreover, there are a lot of satellites that are being used to support uh, Ukraine and being used directly as part of that armed conflict. And Russia is not going after them with that same system. Uh, it's going after them with other capabilities, electronic warfare, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's not using this offensive capability. So that, again, I, I put this out there as a hypothesis. It'll be interesting to see you know, what data we can collect uh, as time goes on about this. It, it may be that these capabilities are really only useful for signaling prestige or, or, or signaling something and are not really military useful. Thank you. Uh, so kind of pulling on a lot of the threads that you started, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Caitlin and ask her to talk us through uh, some of these electronic and cyber capabilities we've seen from Russia. Uh, as Brian mentioned, they started you know, a few months before the invasion of Ukraine with an anti-satellite test, and we've seen uh, really just uh, an array of counter space capabilities in the years since. So I'd love for you to take us through some of those. Thanks, McKenna. Yeah, I think um, what we were what we not noticed in the analysis when doing these reports, looking at Russia's actions in Ukraine, which is, is unfortunately one of the best case studies we as space experts and scholars have into looking how nations think and use counter space weapons in conflict. We saw electronic warfare and cyber warfare used against space systems early and often. So not even on the first day of conflict, but well before. We saw Russia jamming um, overflight missions of the OSCE as they uh, sent long range UAVs to patrol the, um, the Ukrainian and Russian border. We also um, heard reports from the Ukrainian government that um, the day before the conflict, Russia was once again jamming even closer in um, to deny uh, surveillance missions that the Ukrainian government was conducting. And then of course, within the first hours of Russia's invasion, they had a successful attack against a commercial satellite communications company, Viasat, which brought down thousands of ground terminals across Europe, not only affecting the Ukrainian military, which was contracted with Viasat, but also things like wind turbines that were using uh, Viasat's network. So the effects were extremely broad and very successful. And that, of, of course, has been since traced back to Russia as a successful test. And these attacks have, have endured. We continually see jamming from Russia across Ukraine, both attacking uh, the GPS signal or PNT, as well as other communication lines like Starlink. There, um, there are several attempts to jam uh, Starlink as well. And, and as Major General Bratton said, it's unfortunately becoming a norm to be able to use these types of weapons in conflict early and often. And, and the United States and many other countries' lesson learned from this is that this is the kind of operating environment we are going to have to be in. So we need to figure out how to um, operate in a denied or degraded you know, electronic warfare environment. And um, I think, you know, 
that is a, a norm that has been set. Not all norms are good norms. Um, and, and the fact that proliferated jamming against satellite capability is um, you know, one of the first steps of warfare, I think, is, is, could be a norm that we see going forward. And, and kind of pulling on something that you mentioned um, and that Major General Bratton mentioned earlier, uh, that commercial companies have been participating in the Shriver War Games and becoming more involved in some of these conversations. Uh, I'd love to hear from, from any of you, what role have commercial companies been playing in Ukraine uh, and how has that kind of shifted the conversation? Well, it, it, I'll just give it a start. They've been heavily involved. And, you know, I'll, I'll say this is not the first armed conflict where commercial capabilities have played a big role. I think I may have forgotten that throughout uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom, you know, what we call the global war on terror, a huge percentage of U.S. military communications, including a lot of the data flowing over the UAVs, flew over commercial space systems. So it's, it's really not the first conflict those have been involved, but it is a different use. Uh, there are many commercial companies providing remote sensing, providing communications capabilities that are being used directly in the conflict. And so that, I think, is a little bit different, uh, and that raises a whole bunch of questions. Um, uh, Carrie and I were on a, a panel last week, uh, and the question was, you know, does the United States have a responsibility to protect and defend commercial satellite op operations and, and capabilities, uh, whether or not we're involved directly in an armed conflict or not? That's a huge question. It's, it's not different than what we might face, for example, if there was like an attack direct against a U.S. airliner or something. But it is different in the sense that the legal regime of space is different and there are some, some little bit different implications to think through. So that's a whole line of it. Um, there's another whole line of argument about, you know, what is the U.S. responsibility to separate out its military forces from commercial and civil capabilities that would normally be considered non-combatants? Uh, what's the requirement there? Um, and, and as, you know, Victoria has seen uh, firsthand, uh, these questions about the role of commercial has come up in some of these multilateral discussions as well. Yes, uh, again, going back to the national discussions in the United Nations, the open-ended working group, a lot of um, countries that you would assume would be suspicious of U.S. intentions basically say, you know, companies like Starlink are not, in fact, a commercial entity, but they are, in fact, a, almost a branch of the U.S. military and thus considered to be a lawful target. Uh, and so that's concerning because uh, it seems like the ground um, is being laid for them to be um, focused on a much more um, offensive capability than we've seen previously. Yeah, and Russia certainly has that perspective and we've seen um, official language that Russia considers um, commercial companies that are providing data, space data to the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians as lawful, lawful targets during armed conflict. And I remember when the invasion first began and there was the attack on, on uh, Viasat and then the subsequent a attacks on Starlink, this question is, is it lawful to attack uh, commercial companies came up quite often and I'm not a space lawyer, but I think the answer is, yeah, under the laws of armed conflict, it is if they're passing you know, military relevant data directly to military forces, it is a lawful attack. Um, and so I think it's, it's something that the United States and others are starting to think about as we have these incredible commercial ecosystems in our own countries and how they um, provide data to not just the U.S. military, but how do they contract with other uh, militaries around the world as well. Jumping in though, I mean again, just because something's a lawful target doesn't mean you can go full out on it. I mean, there's still rules, right? International humanitarian law talks about distinctions, um, yeah. you know, distinction and proportionality and military necessity. Like, it's not just, you know, fair game once you return to be a lawful target. But it, it is a question that needs to be discussed, you know, because I think a lot of these companies have not factored that in, in terms of, you know, taking on U.S. military contracts. And so if they are going to be considered lawful targets, then maybe they need to, you know, charge more or think something along those lines. Like, it, it's a whole new world in terms of that. Yeah, and, and also if the U.S. government and the Department of Defense is going to be leveraging or using commercial capabilities, both in peacetime and, of course, in armed conflicts, they need to think through what that means and are there legal mechanisms that need to be put in place or policy instruments put in place to deal with, with some of those, those complications. You know, again, this is not new. We have thought about this in other domains. We have structures in place in the air domain, in the maritime domain to take what would normally be commercial or civil assets 
and transfer them over to the military. Um, there are some discussions in the beginning about that in the space domain. Uh, I'll just add, you know, yeah, this is a hugely complicated area of international law. Um, there is a, a publication hopefully coming out later this year called the Woomera Manual, uh, something that I've been involved in as a technical advisor for several years. Uh, that is a, an effort by a large group of international legal scholars to try and figure out what does this body of international humanitarian law, we call the Law of Armed Conflict, apply to com conflict warfare in space. Uh, these manuals exist for the maritime regime, for the air regime, for the cyber regime. The intent of the Woomera manual is to, to lay this out for the space regime, including all those nuances and complexity uh, that, that Victoria hinted at. I would just finally add that we have seen a reaction from commercial companies as they start to consider that they might be lawful um, be targets. And I think I've seen a lot more public statements and investments in their own cybersecurity practices, for example, um, as well as thinking about how does their constellation design, perhaps, whether it's proliferated or distributed, um, really protect or not protect them in the case of these attacks. And then, you know, of course, how would you anticipate um, the type of attack you might face based on um, the type of constellation design that you might have? Yeah, thank you. Um, and kind of going on that same, uh, the same Russia line here, there, we, there's been a lot of expected operations that we've seen from Russia and Ukraine, a lot of this uh, jamming and these cyber warfare operations. Um, but a few activities have been missing or at least not been talked about widely in our open source research. Uh, can I ask if there has been anything that has been unexpected about Russia's actions in Ukraine or aspects that you are surprised that have been missing from this conversation? I mean, for me, uh, looking at what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, it's almost like the dog that didn't bark. You know, why didn't they do more cyber stuff? I mean, really, the thinking was the, their, their cyber capabilities are really strong, and you know, they used a lot of it in the lead up to Ukraine. And so the assumption amongst the cyber folks was, okay, they're definitely going to be using a lot of it. And in fact, I think I, I remember reading that the U.S. military actually pulled a bunch of space uh, companies aside the last, in spring of 2022 and said, okay, we're going to read you into some threats just because it's so serious. We're really worried about cyber attacks on your, on your capabilities. And a lot of that, as far as we know, again, is from open source, so there's possible through stuff that we're just not knowing about or hearing about, but it didn't seem, really seem to happen. And the question is kind of like, why not? And, you know, there are a lot of answers, no, well, I guess thoughts, no real answers, you know. Is it because the Russians thought that they might need those cyber capabilities once they came into Ukraine, you know, they, they figured it'd be an easy role and they could just take over. Is it because they just didn't have those capabilities? Is it because they're saving it for another onslaught at some point? Hard to say. But really, that was kind of a, that was a surprise. Yeah, I think for us as well, and we noted um, in our report on page 34, we, sorry, really, tech, really deep in here, we dive in <laughs> to exactly why we're surprised we didn't see more um, success with its electronic warfare systems, whether that was laser, jamming to uh, counter a, a SAR, all of these, all of this data that we've seen, a, you know, a lot from commercial companies to that has been extremely successful in Ukraine. So imagery, SAR data, uh, communications, why ha wasn't it either attacked or fully, you know, um, fully brought offline? And I think there are a couple possible reasons. And one, um, of course, is that we are, we are public source researchers, open source researchers, so we don't hold clearances. And it, perhaps we just can't find that information because it's classified. Um, also, often alerting the public that an attack happened or was successful, you're, you're giving Russia a battle damage assessment on its successful capabilities. Um, and so taking that into account as well. And it's, it's also possibly that a lot of these systems were overstated. I know both of our reports in past years have talked about um, you know, the airborne lasing system Russia has or ground, potential ground-based lasers. Uh, that we've seen, and you would think that in the case of imagery satellites or, or ISR satellites, that these systems would have been used early and often when we saw how critical they were becoming to Ukrainian um, as capability on the ground and, and targeting. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, this question is being asked not just in the space domain. Uh, I think across the electronic warfare domain, there's been a lot of discussions, why didn't we see as much electronic warfare being used against aircraft, against, you know, uh, civilian uh, systems in general. And 
and, and I think some people have said that's because the Russia may have expected a very easy win, a very quick win, and they didn't want to completely destroy all that or take it down. Um, uh, maybe that just these things aren't as good as we thought they were. Um, the other possibility is that, as, as Victoria mentioned, Russia may be saving these capabilities, right? We know that there are a set of kind of higher level strategic capabilities they are holding back, um, potentially because there might be concerns this might escalate beyond Ukraine, uh, or perhaps they don't want to risk those systems. And so there may be a question, something like Perisvet, right? They're their mobile laser dazzler. That may fall into that category. Maybe they don't have enough of them, or, or they're not operational regulators not willing to risk them being used uh, operationally. And, you know, Victoria mentioned that Russia might just be the dog that didn't bark. Uh, in the CSIS report, we say that Ukraine's resistance against Russia shows that space capabilities may be able to enable, you know, David to beat Goliath. Uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on lessons Goliath nations like China uh, may be taking from this conflict, but also what smaller and less capable space, less space capable nations uh, may realize are necessary space assets in times of conflict. So I'll start, just I'll, I'll reiterate the point of earlier about, about proliferated LEO constellations, right, that we call distributed constellations. Um, that's something that, you know, here in the U.S. we've been talking about for more than 10 years, that that should be a key part of how we re-architect our own national space systems to make them more resilient to attack, in part to deny benefits and therefore deter attacks. That, that's been in place since 2011, national space strategy, at least a, as a goal. Um, I, I, think, I think China definitely uh, agrees with that. If you look at how they are building out some of their key space architectures, particularly when it comes to intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance from space, they are not relying on small numbers of very exquisite, expensive satellites. They are deploying dozens and dozens of satellites, fast iterations, lots of different constellations, uh, lots of different capabilities. Uh, what you would expect from, from this more kind of a proliferated strategy uh, that may be already taken into account something like a, a destructive and a satellite weapon being used against it from the start. So, I mean, I would suspect that many countries are sort of looking at Ukraine and sort of saying, yeah, there, there are definitely some cases where the proof of concept of the value of proliferated LEO has been shown in an actual armed conflict. Now, of course, it's not going to solve every problem, but I think at least for some sets of problems, it's probably, you know, you can kind of check that box. So I would, I would think that is one thing they're taking away. Um, I wanted to address maybe the, the smaller nation side of that question, McKenna. It's not just your access to space or that you can contract with uh, Starlink to bring in space capability or that you have, you know, a couple satellites. I think what's been really unique about Ukraine and the, the ability to use space to, to counter Russia in the war has not just been the public visibility of, of space in general, but how they've brought space to the warfighter directly, how they've brought that data and made it tactical and made it uh, easy and quick to make decisions based off that data and how that data quickly is updated and changes. So it's not just the satellites, it's also the communications and the, the data processing and the ground links and you know the infield operations that allow the decision makers on the battlefield to identify targets or um, you know conduct battle damage assessments. And that I think to me has really shown um, the, the true use of, of space for a smaller nation fighting, you know, maybe a, a more capable space nation, that it's not necessarily about the amount of satellites you have, but it's how you can actually process, use, um, and, and direct that data in the right way to the right people at the right moment. And McKenna, I think Brian and Caitlin really covered it, but just my one contribution to this is that um, I think a lot of countries have seen, not just from a military viewpoint, but from a PR viewpoint, the explosion of Earth observation satellites, mm -hmm. excuse the language explosion, but the, the amount of uh, Earth observation satellites that are up there are taking pictures, they're great because they're unclassified and you can use them to demonstrate convoys, you can use them to show you know, there's something threatening you, you can use them all sorts of purposes you know, to get the public and the international community on your side and that's the, 
that's not to be um, sneezed at in terms of a capability. That's a great point because Ukraine has been using mm -hmm. that imagery to showcase Russia's war crimes as well right. and bring that evidence to the international judicial systems. And that's pretty unique to me as well. Mm -hmm. And also, right in the lead up to the war, right, the United States had a very uh, public and very organized campaign to demonstrate that Russia was, was thinking about this, that was going this way, and they were using a lot of this unclassified commercial imagery and other data to be able to make that case that, you know, we couldn't do that in the past if, without revealing national sources that, you know, we wouldn't want to do. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to shift a little bit now to, to talking about China a little bit. Uh, although not, not a counter space capability, we did just learn this week that their space plane landed after, I think, 276 days in orbit. Uh, I'd like to, do you have any comments on this capability? Uh, and then beyond just the space plane capability, uh, some of their developments throughout the past year as well. So I'll quickly start with the space plane. Um, I think it's, it's fascinating how similar this program appears to be to the American X-37B. Uh, in multiple ways, right? They, they appear to be doing many of the same things on orbit. Um, both countries kind of shared a lot of the same concerns about what else they could be doing. I know, you know, when the U.S. first started flying the X-37B, there was a lot of concern, and we saw that in a lot of meetings from the Chinese, from the Russians, others about, oh, this could be an orbital weapons platform, what else is it doing, you know? And, and even up to this day in the OEWG, they're talking about that. Um, and I would suspect, now that there's reports out there of this Chinese space plane deploying a small satellite and rendezvousing and docking with it, lots of concerns here in the U.S. about what this similar capability might mean. Um, you know, to be honest, we don't have a ton of data on these. Uh, of course, the X-37B, uh, the U.S. guards that pretty closely and doesn't release a lot of data on it. So we don't really, and we know a little bit about what it does in orbit and where it's been, but we don't have a lot of good tracking data uh, in, in the open source public domain. We have a little bit more um, on the Chinese space plane because there are some commercial companies that have been tracking it and they're, of course they track the X-37B as well, but they're a little more willing to talk about uh, uh, the Chinese program. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how that develops over time and, and maybe whether that sparks some discussions between US and China and others about norms of behavior or rules of engagement and that sort of thing for these kinds of capabilities. Yeah, I mean, I would just add as well, um, in the previous years, our, uh, the Secure World Counter Space Threat Assessment included um, uncoordinated close approaches as a, like, a possible co-orbital capability, and really the only countries doing it in previous years were the U.S. and Russia. But China has been doing it. The, 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 again, this is the first time that we know about open source, blah, blah, blah. But this is the first year we've actually seen it, and so that has been interesting to see that evolve as a potential, again, I say potential, co-orbital capability. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of non-offensive reasons why they would want this sort of capability, just like there's lots of non-offensive reasons why the United States wants this capability. But it is a demonstration and an evolution of their, their space capabilities. In years past, I have taken um, ownership of the China section, but this year I actually gave it to McKenna, <laughs> and I took Russia. So I want to just turn it around to you, McKenna, as the China expert from this year. <laughs> what, you know, what did you think? Yeah, I mean, the only thing that I think I'll add is that we haven't seen a ton come out from China and no huge counter space tests, you know, no super alarming jamming or cyber capabilities that we've seen this year, um, which I think has been kind of an interesting departure from what we've seen in a lot of years past, um, which I think may be a sign that they are maybe taking things a bit further underground um, or just maintaining some of these capabilities and not, you know, deploying anything new on orbit. Uh, I don't think that this is a sign that they are slowing down any operations, um, but maybe that they just have um, have more of their own system um, and they're able to do these a little bit more, you know, maybe a little bit privately. Uh, that, that's actually a really good point. For all of the concern and hyperbole about China, the threat China poses in space, we are seeing the Russians do a lot more. Now, part of that is because the Russians are involved in an armed conflict at the moment, mm -hmm. and, and China is not. I uh, know it's a great point. And, um, uh, and there was one thing I wanted to say, I just lost it. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll ask you another question. Um, this year, something else that's been interesting is kind of these cat and mouse games that we've seen uh, in GEO that have been intriguing, uh, both from Russian inspector satellites like Luch, uh, as well as Chinese satellites that have been engaging actually with US satellites. Um, what stands out about these activities to you guys? Well, I'll jump in and actually one of the, these 
chases that we saw from Russia this past year was in low Earth orbit. Um, and it was a, a Russian satellite that stalked an NRO satellite through LEO. And I thought was what was really interesting, and I'd love y'all's take on it as well, is that it happened so quickly in the satellite's lifetime. Often we see these satellites up in orbit for at least a couple weeks to a couple months of bringing the satellite online, you know, getting it to nominal operations, and then we see it start to maneuver towards another satellite to perform an RPO or to, as we like to say, stalk it through uh, space. But this one happened within four days of that satellite's operations. Um, and launch, and that to me was really unique and surprising to see because for me that reads that this was its mission, to go up and to, they knew which satellite they wanted to follow, they launched it into an orbit so that it would quickly be able to conduct its mission within four days of being launched, which was really surprising. Um, and of course it got, you know, it, it did get close enough in its close approach to maybe take images or collect some signals, intelligence. Again, this is a hypothesis we don't know in the public source, but it didn't actually cause any physical or harmful damage that we can tell as it then uh, followed the NRO satellite through LEO. And so I'd love y'all's take as well. No, I think that that, that was also very interesting. It shows perhaps a, a, an improvement in the program, right? They've gone from kind of early stage R&D testing to maybe something that is a little more ready to actually do an operation. We're still not really sure why yeah. this, this is there. Um, is it a signaling? Is it turns? We're not really sure what's going on there. Um, but it's really interesting. I, I do remember, um, we, there's also, uh, China may have also done a couple more of its directus and ASAT tests, again, against ballistic targets, not against orbital targets. Uh, there was language that they had done, I'm trying to recall, I think it was something, uh, 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 mid-course missile defense intercept tests in I think 2021 to the 22, which is very similar language to what uh, China has used for its direct and ASAP tests after 2007. Um, and of course, this is a capability. If you can hit a satellite, you can also hit a nuclear payload that is flying through space, mid-course missile defense. So there's a lot of overlap between those two capabilities. Of course, the U.S. in 2008 used a ground-based mid-course missile defense system to intercept a, an ailing NRO satellite. Um, so we're not entirely sure that it did two more tests uh, of its uh, direct and ASAT system, but there's a chance that it could have, and we just need to figure out, get some more data on that. Right, and then going back to your question, McKenna, about the cat and mouse, I mean, I think that really speaks to the need to have these understandings of what's considered responsible behavior. Um, again, going back to the discussions at the UN, the Open End Working Group, some of the ideas being promoted there is that it's considered bad form to do an uncoordinated close approach. Um, and so it's considered irresponsible to do that sort of thing. Um, I can't frankly see the United States giving up that capability, but there is the argument for having something like an, we, the secure world has called for an incidence in space agreement, where the idea you have an agreement in terms of what military satellites are allowed to do in terms of RPO activities, and that way you can identify, again, the concern is always an inadvertent escalation. You want to be able to identify when something's happening that you don't expect and that you're not worried about, you don't know how to handle. And so having uh, an agreement or having you know, a, a step form that you can respond to and having established points of contact that you can make phone calls to when you have questions, that would be really helpful, particularly since, as, as you said, we're starting to see more and more of these types of activities. And just to add on, so, so the general mentioned that he talked to his colleagues in the air domain about what do they do about aircraft approaching a border. Well, in the air and sea domains, we do have um, in some cases, they're just sort of understandings. In some cases, like the instance it's agreement, it's codified in a treaty, but list of this is what is expected behavior for the interactions of ships and aircraft on the high seas and international airspace. Um, so we are starting to talk about that in space space. Uh, I'll just add that it's really hard. Um, distance is probably not the thing you measure because there are certain orbits where you are 100 kilometers away and it's actually really hard to get up and actually touch that object. There's other orbits where if you're 1,000 kilometers away, it's really easy. Um, maybe things like relative energy, but now that's a whole different question. It's a lot harder to wrap your brain around. Uh, it's a lot harder to explain. Pilots are used to talking with their hands and what that means. Um, but that, that may be what makes this really difficult to come to these agreements is you just can't put down 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers and call it a day.
Yeah, absolutely. And one of my last questions before moving to audience questions uh, is looking at key developments beyond Russia and China. Um, I know we, we all cover some more countries in our report, Secure World, a few more than our CSIS report. Um, you know, something that we noted this year was that Iran seemed to have a lot more success in their launches um, and some more momentum from some space doctrine and theory. I'd love to hear any of your opinions on other countries that have been, uh, you know, really been, uh, been looking at space a little bit more. I will say what interesting um, trend that I'm starting to see is that a lot of countries are starting to verbalize that they want to have um, non I'm sorry, offensive, non-destructive electronic warfare capabilities for space. Like specifically spelling out the Australians have brought that up. I think the Japanese have talked about it. The French have talked about it as well, um, which is not something we would have seen even just like a year or so ago. Um, and so I think definitely the idea that there's um, a military utility to having non-destructive um, counter space capabilities that can still interfere or degrade uh, with an enemy's um, space asset is again a benefit. And now you could argue that whether that's destabilizing. We had a whole discussion earlier about you know whether jamming is here to stay. It looks like it is. But I mean, so I think a lot of countries are starting to look into that. And again, that seems like a fairly new um, perspective that is openly talked about. Let's put it that way. Well, and there's a difference if it's a ground based jammer system right. versus if it's something that is space based. Yeah. Um, I was very interested this year about, um, from, from France, actually. So back in 2017, when the Russian satellite Luch performed a close approach near Athena Fidus, which is a French-Italian communications satellite, uh, the French in particular were very vocal. And the defense foreign minister spoke out against the action and said, um, that France was going to begin to look into developing bodyguard satellites for its high value assets. Since then, I hadn't seen really much movement on that topic. However, this year they did begin the program and award contracts to develop said bodyguard satellites for high value assets. And that is the first that I've really seen, at least publicly, any country put money towards having these bodyguard satellites. Now, it's not quite clear what the bodyguard satellites um, will host, whether that is an onboard jamming system or maybe kinetic shootback system. Uh, there are lots of options. I, actually, we kind of explored many of them in our uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts in Space report, which looks at how do you defend satellites on orbit. Um, and so I'm interested in to see how that program shapes up and then what do they determine as high value assets mm -hmm. and which satellites get these bodyguard satellites. Are they only geo satellites, which is where the Luch close approach uh, happened, or are they also thinking about putting them in low Earth orbit? My favorite part of that, the acronym. Yoda. 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 Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very appropriate. Um, and, and of course, what are the rules of engagement yes. for employing yeah. those questions? Yeah, no, it's it's really interesting. Uh, uh, my sense is that the most likely scenario, now, it's pretty clear they're going to have some sort of direct energy electronic warfare system on board these satellites. The question is to what end? Um, my sense is it's, it, it's more likely they would be used in sort of a jamming interference role. So, for example, if I've got a an RPO satellite trying to get close to your satellite, if you can interfere with my optics, with the LIDAR, with the things I'm using to detect and close in, that would make it hard to do that. And so that's my guess as to what they're likely to do. Uh, I think it's a little harder to envision how to make from an engineering and our perspective some sort of destructive or some sort of kinetic capability. Um, and the French have been pretty clearly saying they are not going to pursue a destructive and a satellite capability. So it would likely be something in the temporary reversible realm. Um, just to pick up on the, on the thread that Victoria mentioned, so um, you know we have a nice handy chart on the website that, that has um, our report on there, satellite chart, sort of assessing capabilities across all the countries we look at in our report. Um, there's some interesting patterns there. All of them are developing space situation awareness because that is sort of the foundation, right? You need SSA or what the US military calls space domain awareness to be able to detect threats, but you also need it to be able to target other objects. So that's sort of the, you know, that's the you know, table stakes for everybody to get involved. Almost everyone is developing electronic warfare, as we've talked about quite a bit. Um, and we're pretty sure almost everybody's developing cyber capabilities. But that's really hard to analyze in the open source because, you know, 
unless somebody says they were used, it's really hard to know that they were that they were used. Um, we're still only seeing a limited number of countries, U.S., Russia, China, uh, and India, that are uh, at least having dedicated R&D testing efforts for the destructive options, um, and, and, and we'd like to keep it that way, at least for our organization is one that's focused on space sustainability. Uh, and then I think the other one I'll just I'll, I'll mention is when we started working on this report six years ago, there was a lot of concern over uh, uh, in, uh, sorry, Iran and North Korea, right? They were kind of put in the question. Um, they're not really doing a lot mm -hmm. when it comes to counter space. Yeah. Electronic warfare, yes. Cyber, yes. Uh, SSA, yes. But we don't really see any evidence, at least in, again in the open source, of efforts to develop direct us and ASAT, co-orbital capabilities, these more advanced capabilities. Um, even directed energy is still pretty difficult it seems to be for them to get at. So um, I think that's another interesting thing that I've seen over the last several years. And I have a question here from uh, one of our ASP interns, Patrick Fish. Uh, what about non-state actors? Uh, are they becoming increasingly threatening to space security? Do we see examples of counter space capabilities from non-state actors? Um, it's a really good question, uh, just a little bit. Um, primarily in the cyber electronic warfare, Mm -hmm. uh, for those of who are old enough to remember Captain Midnight in the 1980s, uh, you know, somebody who was upset about HB, I think it was HBO charging money for TV and jammed the satellite signal. Um, that kind of stuff is going on here and there for a while, but not, not, not widespread. Uh, the last several years at the uh, annual uh, DEF CON and Black Hat Hacker Conventions, there have been some really interesting papers of these hackers just going after some commercial space system and saying, hey, let's apply my entire tool set to this system and see what we find and they find a lot of stuff right it turns out there's problems with validation authentication you know you know poor credentials all kinds of you know not validating user inputs all the things you find other software applications you find them in space as well so a little bit but but not a not a ton that we've seen at least yeah i agree i think uh you know the cyber testing and then a lot of localized jamming for GPS particularly, but also uh, like the unprotected signal of GPS, and then also, you know, some communications. Uh, one of my favorite stories is that um, there was a group of like delivery drivers on like mopeds or Vespas in Southeast Asia who had spoofing technology to spoof their location somewhere else so they would get the best um, rates and the best pickups, but they, because it was raining, they would actually like hot, like stay underneath some covered parking lot like miles away. And so this is obviously not a counter space threat that's going to affect a government or any of our high value systems, but it is a really interesting test case in how accessible this technology really is and how individuals can use it for their own personal benefit. I have nothing to add to what um, Caitlin and Brian brought up, but just pointing out um, under the Outer Space Treaty, Article 6, countries have a responsibility to supervise the actions of their nationals. And so you could argue, even if it's a non-state actor doing the jamming or non-state actor doing the cyber, if they're doing it from within a certain country's territory, if they're nationals from a certain country, you could make the argument that country is ultimately responsible and ultimately mm -hmm. liable for the actions of their citizens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. We have a couple of questions, um, too, about China that are coming through. Uh, the first from Bruce McDonald from John Topkin Sice. Uh, are there signs that hey, yeah. <laughs> are there signs that China is looking at a proliferated Leo uh, for its space deployments to enhance their survivability? Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are definitely seeing it for their their ISR for their imagery reconnaissance constellations in low Earth orbit. Um, of course, also Beidou is just like GPS and just like Galileo is by nature uh, a pretty distributed system. Um, China has gone a little bit beyond that in that. There's actually three different Beidou's and there's a geosynchronous system that is providing regional uh, capabilities as well. So it's even a little more so distributed uh, uh, than, uh, than the US GPS system. Um, hard to tell beyond that. Uh, you know, there's some evidence that China has started to finally develop a missile warning satellite capability, but, but that's still very early stage and it's only a couple of test vehicles as far as we can tell. So beyond, uh, you know, beyond P and T and uh, and ISR, it, it's it's hard to tell. Not proliferated Leo necessarily from like a military viewpoint, 
But China does have plans to have its own version of Starlink in terms of the GW constellation, which is planned to be 13,000 satellites, which I, I argue is definitely proliferation. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, okay. And it's in LEO. So technically, I guess it is proliferated LEO. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but it's not like necessarily a military capability, and it doesn't exist yet, but it's something they've got planned. Um, and again, because I think they've seen a lot of the benefits in Starlink. Absolutely. And um, also there's concern, not just by China, but from a lot of countries that um, certain orbits are going to get full. And they're going to lose out, whether it's terms of spectrum or slots or, you know, just kind of orbital shells are going to reach the carrying capacity. And so a lot of countries are rushing to try and fill up the blanks before they get they lose um, access to LEO. Uh, yeah, no, it's a great point. It's the, and, and what's interesting is that GW constantly, it's not, it, it's kind of new, but not really in that there were plans for two different kind of several hundred satellite constellations. Uh, that have been merged into this much bigger program, and they've actually created a new kind of major state-owned enterprise entity to run this whole thing that's getting a lot of support from uh, one of the provincial governments. So uh, it, it appears to be a, a significant a kind of national interest uh, kind of program. Yeah, I would just plug McKenna's paper that she wrote on, uh, it's called uh, Low Orbit High Stakes, yes. and it's on <laughs> proliferated LEO communications constellations. It's thank a great you. report. Well, thank yeah. you. Um, another question we have from a graduate student, uh, what positive steps, if any, do we see being taken between the U.S. and China to de-escalate tensions uh, or the risk of conflict? Are there open channels of communication? Uh, what's that relationship like? Well, I mean, there have been some, like, you know, track one strategic dialogues, bilateral dialogues that have not happened in a little while. Um, so I think that is a positive step. I think there's probably, in my opinion, there's an understanding that there's a need to have some sort of, again, not necessarily a red, t a red phone, but some sort of communication between the two countries. And so I think we're starting to see some steps towards that. Um, of course, uh, I'm sure you know the United States and China are prevented from doing bilateral cooperation from between the White House, OSTP, um, and, um, and NASA with their, their Chinese counterparts, unless they meet a series of what we call speed bumps in terms of you know notifying Congress and checking the FBI and that sort of thing. So um, it's not impossible, but there is that the Wolf Amendment that is basically hinder, um, hampering a little bit this cooperation. Um, I think really what I would say is probably the best chance of, uh, I won't say resetting, but possibly recalibrating the U.S.-Chinese relationship in space is what we see in terms of the moon. Uh, that both countries have plans to go back to the well, to go to the moon, go back to the moon, China go to the moon, um, and um, and you know the, there's been announcements in terms of what bases they want to use, and a lot of times they're similar spots, and so there's going to be a need to deconflict, a need to cooperate. Well, I won't say cooperate, but a need to coordinate, a need to communicate. And my hope is that we don't replicate the hostilities on Earth immediately on the moon, uh, because I think that can definitely make a situation happen that might not have happened otherwise. And we've shown in history with working with the Soviet Union that it is possible to cooperate in space, and even working with Russia in space with our own astronauts, the ISS, after the 2014 invasion, Crimea, um, and, today. and today with Ukraine, that we can, we can continue these relationships. And, what a great question, because I was actually talking about this this morning with our intern, Yash, who is writing a paper on this right now. And I've learned a lot just from reading it that actually we did have a civil bilateral dialogue in 2014, and the Obama administration was working on a hotline. Um, personally, I don't know where that stands, so I would point to Yash, and I'm sure he knows where that stands, and he's staring at me with the answer in his head, I know. Um, but I, you know, I do agree. I'm focused right now on a bunch of cislunar and lunar research, and so I, I would hope that um, the possibility of deconfliction in the sake of not risking human life on the moon would spur both countries to have a bit more um, civil communication dialogue. Um, that maybe would build some trust, maybe would build some transparency um, that could lead or bleed into other areas. Uh, yeah, quickly to add on to that, yes, the bunch did start uh, uh, two different uh, dialogues uh, with, with China. Um, the Trump administration actually did uh, plan to continue it and held one of them, but then COVID hit, and that basically mm -hmm. put a damper on all the in-person meetings, yeah. international travel, uh, and as far as I know, it hasn't resumed since, so that's a real challenge. Uh, and, and at least what, we, what, we've, what I've read in the press is that, according to the Department of Defense, there is not a direct high-level military-military uh, 
exchange going on between the U.S. and China, um, which, you know, while I understand the, the political challenges in doing that, given we've talked about it, I think that that's probably pretty important to get to at some point. I will say there is a bright spot. The, this open-ended working group that Victoria has mentioned a couple of times, um, I got to go uh, attend a couple of days of it uh, in January of this year in Geneva. It's the first time I'd gotten a chance to go see these kind of discussions in person, and I was rather surprised in a, in a positive way by the level of discussion and exchange of views. Um, there were, you know, statements and exchanges from the U.S., Russia, China, and several other countries that were actually responding to each other and exchanging information in which you don't always get in some of these diplomatic settings. Uh, and they were speaking past each other a little bit, but at least there was some agreement on what the big issues were. Uncoordinated close approaches was absolutely an issue that they were all talking about as something that needs to be addressed. Thank you. And uh, looking a little bit more broadly, uh, in both of our space threat assessments, we mentioned all four members of the Quad. Uh, so U.S., Japan, Australia, and India, uh, which are rapidly evolving in their space capabilities. Um, how can this alliance utilize their space capabilities to further shared strategic goals in the Indo-Pacific? And this is from a student in our audience, Nikhil. I mean, I think it's tough because we, I'm not convinced, I'm sorry, that the Quad actually has one strategic goal. I mean, other than hold off China, which is something, but that's not really, I mean, they each have their own reasons. Um, India has, shall we say, a complicated relationship with China. Um, Australia is, you know, increasing its um, space programs and increasing its military space program is all relatively new. Um, and the U.S., of course, has lots of historical baggage in the area. And so I think it's tough to say, well, they're going to come together and come to agreement, with, particularly when you have something like NATO, which has decades of experience and still basically has a space policy in that they identify space as something that's important. And that's pretty much it. Um, so maybe the Quad, because it's smaller, and you have a chance to be a little bit more agile, I'm not sure yet. Um, I think it is a, a, a possibility, but I wouldn't put it... Um, a lot of faith in it. I think it's good in terms of sharing information, um, but in terms of maybe becoming like a new Five Eyes, I don't see that as happening. I think it's, it's quite interesting that, you know, Japan is reshaping its space strategy and its defense space strategy in, in particular. Um, Australia has established a space command and is really focusing on um, what their needs are as a nation for in space and then also what they can leverage from their own domestic capability to bring as um, an ally to a lot of the conversations I have is like, what, what does the United States need that we can provide? Like, how can we better build this alliance? Um, and so they're really thinking strategically about what are their domestic industries that are excellent, that they can leverage in space and they can partner with the United States on um, in Japan as well. And then, India is an extremely capable space nation relatively um, to the quad. You know, they have an incredible launch capability. They have a, a strong civil program, you know, an unfortunate, um, an unfortunate accident with the, with the lunar lander, but they are working on the next one. Um, cheaper and faster than basically any other nation, which Turns is... Turns out landing on the moon is kind of hard. Kind of hard. <laughs> yeah. uh, Soft landing. Yeah. Soft yes. Landing. Yeah. Hard landing, easy. Um, and, and so I think it's really interesting, but I haven't quite seen that military or security piece from um, the Indian government in space. And so while we see a bit of progression from Japan and Australia on that, for me, it still remains to be seen what India's national goals are with space security. Um, and then how does the U.S. You know, fit into all of that? Obviously, um, the, the pivot to the Indo-Pacific by DOD um, has been critical, and, and how do we make sure that there is the capability and coverage in that region? Maybe it's by relying a little bit more on our allies and partners in that area as well. I think, Caitlin, the reason why you don't understand or don't know what India's security interests are in space, because India itself has not come down on where it wants to do. So it's not just me. It's not just you. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't miss the thing. I mean, they, they finally put out a national space policy um, just within the past couple weeks. After years of saying, okay, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, does not talk about security issues in it at all, okay. so, which is not unusual. Thank you. And to wrap this up, I'll ask my last question. Um, we've covered a lot of ground today from the report, importance of resiliency to commercial services in space uh, to international trends and norm building. Um, you know, we've been doing this for six years and six assessments. 
Uh, are there any noticeable patterns uh, or insight into foreign counterspace doctrine that you think policymakers in the U.S. should be paying attention to? And what does this mean for U.S. national security? So uh, I'll just I'll, I'll reiterate something I mentioned earlier. Uh, we are seeing kind of everybody talk about SSA. Everyone's going electronic warfare and probably cyber. Um, and we should probably expect those are going to be proliferated and kind of used everywhere. Uh, and we need to worry about that. Uh, and then there's this set of, you know, destructive capabilities which a much smaller group of countries are exploring. And I'm not sure how, as I mentioned sort of earlier, I'm not sure how important those are going to be or how concerned we should be about going forward. That, that's an open question. Yeah, I think as countries tend to shift to proliferated, distributed um, systems, you have different types of counter space weapons that are more effective in attacking or denying, degrading the access to those systems that are not direct ascent ASATs and that are maybe electronic warfare, cyber. We mentioned our report, a high altitude nuclear device could do the trick, even though I don't think none of us would ever recommend that. Um, and so it's interesting over the six years to watch that conversation shift away. And I think I remember when we first wrote this report, you know, everyone wanted to talk about the direct ascent ASAT. And we were like, no, please stop talking about the direct ascent ASAT. Talk about electronic warfare, talk about cyber, because that's where the, the momentum really is. And I think that message has hopefully come across a bit. And I would just also say, you know, that I think the impact of our reports over these six years has been incredible in bringing to light how much of this information really is in the open source research and how we can have a broader public conversation, um, not just within the United States, but internationally with our allies and partners in the open-ended working group. These resources, I think, are just critical and it's been fascinating to watch uh, the acceptance and the, the spread of, uh, of our work and the impact over the six years. Right, um, I mean, good policy is based on good input and so if there's bad input in terms of hyperbolic assessments or tainted assessments or things of that nature. Um, there's just going to be good policy, and that was kind of our goal for starting working on this sort of thing. Um, I will say as well, another evolution that I've seen in the six years we've been working on it, when Secure World Foundation did our first one, we had six countries that we included on it. And then um, U.S., um, Russia, China, India, Iran, North Korea. And then in 2020, we added two more, Japan and France and added SSA for capabilities. And then last year we added three more. We added Australia, United Kingdom, and South Korea. And so, I mean, part of the reason is um, I think a lot more countries are starting to put resources and capabilities into military space organizations because there's an understanding that space is a key national security enabler and that there's a need to protect it and to enhance it and use it as one tool in terms of a space program for any of these countries. Um, and I think uh, you know, every year we kind of have like a to watch lists of countries that we think, well, we're going to add this year. And um, so there's a few that we have for possibly the next year or two. But I do see this expanding. I do see this happening. Um, I like to think that if we continue communication, if we continue to have these international discussions, whether in multilateral four, whether bilateral, whether they're track one or track two, we can make sure that space is not inadvertently escalating to an environment where there is active conflict and that there's ways in which to ensure that space capabilities are there for everyone and accessible for all over the long term. And we're hoping that these products help contribute in some small way to that sort of outcome. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think that really says it all. Um, thank you to our wonderful, wonderful panelists for joining us today. Uh, you can find our space threat assessments online and also listed on the web page. Uh, and thank you so much to Major General Bratton from Starcom for joining us this afternoon as well. Um, have a great afternoon.